Hi, I'm Curtis Thompson, and welcome to Then and Now, a piece of our African American history, as told by our fine panel of guests here who have been here at least the baby of the bunch is 83 years old. So they have some stories to tell that are going to be relevant for us and our generations to come. Stay tuned. Welcome back. Well, right now we're going to introduce our panel of distinguished guests who are going to tell you a little bit about themselves uh, and a little bit about where they're from in their lives. Um, so let's start over here on my far left. Uh, go ahead and introduce yourself, Mr. Lyles. I'm Pastor James Lyles. I'm 88 years old. I was born in Texarkana, Texas in 1928. Wow, 1928, that's, you said 88? Eight, 88 years old? 88 years old. Wow, God bless you. Let's move to our next distinguished panelist, um, which, which you just amazed me so much, Miss um, Foster. My name is Joanna Foster. I was born, I'm a hundred, and two years old. I was born in a little country place by the name of Waukesha, Louisiana. And that's near Opelousas, Louisiana. What else? That's, that's okay for, we're gonna come back and you're gonna get a chance to tell us a bunch of good stuff, 102 years old. I know you have some things that you can share with this generation, so we're gonna come back to that in just a moment. Next up we have Miss Robinson. Can you speak into the mic and tell us uh, about yourself? Um, my name is Delano Catherine Hadley Robinson. <clears throat> I was born in 1933 on a plantation in Thomasville, Georgia, which is southeast part of the United States, near Tallahassee, Florida. On the plantation that the owners, original owners, are my uh, heritage. Right, that's wonderful. So I'm pretty much, I'm not really, I'm just mixed with Irish and Indian and African. Uh, I can't wait to hear about all of that. And last but not least, we have on the end here, uh, Mr. Gilmore. My name is Edward Robert Gilmore. Edward Robert Gilmore, I was born in Columbus, Ohio in 1926. 1926, that makes you 90 years old. Whew. That is wonderful, first of all, let me just say what it is and what an honor it is for me to sit here and, uh, and glean from your fields as you share your stories, um, you know, going forward. Uh, it is really, really an honor for me. I'm looking forward to hearing what it is that uh, you have to say. So let's go back to the beginning. Um, and, and Mr. Lau, tell us, tell us, uh, just tell us about your life. Tell us about what it was like growing up and, and the, all of this stuff. I grew up on a plantation in a little community called Homer, Arkansas. Mm -hmm. It was the Bryant Plantations and the Anderson Plantation. And then we moved to the Austin Plantation. And after living on the Anderson Plantation for five or six years. We moved to the Austin Plantation and that was after the war began, World War II. And then in, in 1944, we moved to Texarkana, Arkansas. I was born on the Texas side, but we moved back to Arkansas. And we, Bring that mic up for me. And we lived in a little village called Iron Mountain, Iron Mountain Edition. 
it was close enough to the city to say that we had moved to town, <laughs> but it was also in the country where we brought our cows, and yeah. our pigs, and our dogs, and all of that with us. So we virtually lived close enough to walk to town, but we were still country folk living in the country. And I, we lived there. Uh, I was 14, and I re-entered high school, Booker T. Washington High School, Texarkana, Arkansas, and I uh, finished high school in 1948, and then I made ready for college. So you said you, you finished high school in what year again? 1948. You finished high school in 1948. 1948, and was fortunate enough to matriculate into Philander Smith College at Little Rock, Arkansas. And I graduated in 1952. When I graduated from high school, I graduated at the foot of my class. When I graduated from college, I graduated at the head of my class. All right now. And uh, at that time, Southern Methodist University's Perkins School of Theology decided that they were no longer going to discriminate against people because of race. And so the trustees voted to admit people of color, black folk, as regular students in the theological seminary as, a, as an effort to begin desegregating, uh, integrating the entire university. There were five persons selected as, to be admitted as regular students. I was one of those five persons. So, you are a pastor. I was a pastor. How long did you, uh, how long did you uh, preach? 48 years under orders. After that, for 15 years, I was a chaplain at various hospitals and hospices in the Los Angeles uh, area. And when Robert Kennedy Hospital closed um, in, 19, in 2006, uh, I was too old to ask anybody to give me a job. So I went to Barber College, and I finished Barber College and uh, cut hair in nursing homes, convalescent homes, until I got to the place where I said, I'm gonna hang it up. And I hung it up. All right, no, all right. Well, we're gonna come back and ask you some other questions, because some of the things you said um, really piqued uh, some curiosity, some things that weren't on my question list, but we definitely have to talk about, um, especially with regards to integration in a theological seminary, um, because that, uh, you know, God is God, and I don't know if the white God, black God, or and that whole thing about how you have to integrate that teaching of the word, of the teachers of the word, is, is an interesting topic to me. So I want to come back to that one. Next, we have. Uh, oh. Yeah, we have you. <laughs> Let's tell us something about yourself. 102 years old. My God. I was. I went to school in. Waukesha, Louisiana, for a few years, and then we moved to Welch, Louisiana, and uh, I went to school there. However, I did not finish high school until I moved to Los Angeles after, and quite much older, I was much older than I should have been, according to the way 
kids went to school at that time. And I went to school and to the beauty school in Los Angeles down on Broadway. And then from there, I went to Jeff High School mm. in Los Angeles. And just catching school, really, wherever I could catch it. And I did not really finish high school till after I had been married and had a baby and moved to Pasadena, California. So I went to the high school in, in LA, in Pasadena. Stay in the mic, sweetheart. The high school in Pasadena. That's why I graduated from high school. So life was a little hard for me and my sisters and my brothers. My brother went to school in LA and got his high school diploma in Los Angeles. The other brother took up a trade in painting, painting courses in Houston, Texas. And then from one thing to another, what else would you like to know? That's okay, we're gonna come back and ask you some questions. So you went to, uh, you went to beauty school so you could show them what beautiful looked like, is that what that was? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, went to I know, that's school right. And graduated from beauty school under Mrs. Williams. Can't think of a first name. But it was great. We went from Pasadena to LA every day. And finally, we finished school. And we went to. It's a little difficult for me to remember where all, where all the places were, but we had a big blowout in LA for the beauticians and barbers over the hotel. I can't remember now which hotel it was. Listen, let me just tell you something. I can only imagine when you walked into that beauty school, how people must have just, you know, fellas turning their head, because I'm looking at you now. You're 102 and you are gorgeous. I just had to tell you that. <laughs> Thank you. Well, let's, let's, uh, let's, let's move on, because we're gonna ask some questions. We're gonna get, really get into some more meat about this. So, Miss Robinson, for, so, for, wait a minute, I gotta, I gotta tell this to the camera real quick before, because we're gonna come back to this one, but I want to tease them, I want them to know this. Hold on a second. Our next distinguished person is Miss Robinson. She was married to Mac Robinson, okay? For those of you who don't know, Mac Robinson was Jackie's brother. And let her tell that he, he was the taller, good-looking brother, because <laughs> that's the one she married. She has some, we were in the green room and she was talking to me about some of the things um, related around the Olympics um, and, and Hitler and, and that whole, thing that was going on during that time. And we really, really are looking forward to getting that information uh, of his, that piece of history from you, because that's just great. So I'll, enough of the commercial right now. Um, I'm gonna let you go ahead and speak about yourself. Yes, uh, during the time that um, um, my growing up, I'll start with as a youth. I was born on the plantation in Georgia, and um, we um, worked partially for the people of the plantation and the, they were the master and my father was a chauffeur, my mom was a cook and uh, my dad bought a piano for us, for the home and we participated in Sunday school, church and grew up <clears throat> learning how to sing and in groups, there was a group in our family that uh, we just loved music. Mm. And I'm a number eight of 15 brothers and sisters. I had four brothers that was served in the United States Army from World War II up until the Vietnam War, and an uncle in World War I. But um, getting back to the family real quick, I um, 
where on my side of the family is music. And um, most of all, all the, well, I lost one sister at, uh, as a baby, an older sister, but the next 14 of us, my mom and dad were able to uh, send us off to college is with what earnings they could earn on the plantation as a cook and as a chauffeur. Wait, 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 wait. You just said that you, your parents working on a plantation as a chauffeur and a cook sent 14 children to college? My, my father and mother worked in those days the schooling, uh, to go to school, it was nothing nowhere near like what you pay for schooling today. It was on the quarter system. And it was like $25 a quarter, 25 to 35. And uh, there were very, very few to zero scholarships. There were none. So if not that, there, was, there were trade schools that um, some of my brothers and sisters participated in and graduated from. And if not that, then the four brothers that I had were drafted. They were all drafted. Mm -hmm. But my oldest brother was a minister. And uh, at that time, they would not take the oldest son in a family, nor the youngest in the 40s. And uh, I had two brothers that was in World War II, and one went to Germany. But getting back to school time, um, we all sang, and we, there was a group we used to participate in uh, church community activities, and my dad would sing with us. And my, one of my sisters played the piano named Agnes. She lives in Detroit, Michigan now. But what I'd like to say quickly is that um, uh, the uh, twins, there were twins in my family, mm -hmm. Marie and Richard. Richard uh, went to college at Florida a and on a scholarship there and uh, was a band instructor. He ended up band instructor. He's retired from that now. And his twin sister is a metropolitan European opera singer. And she was, she won on the Ted Max Amateur Hour many years ago. She sang on the Ed Sullivan Show many times, way back in the day. And uh, she used she, to travel all over the country, Europe and everywhere. Mm -hmm. And then she got a scholarship to go to Germany to get another degree if she wanted to get her doctorate in opera singing. Let me ask you she something. She lives back on the East Coast. She doesn't live in California. Do you sing? Yes, I do. I do sing in my mm. church choir here. Okay, I might, I might have to have you hum a few I bars sing. a little bit later. Let's, I sing, uh, well, alto or contralto and soprano. And uh, my family's, my mom could sing, my dad also could sing. So we just, and on my husband's side, it's, you know, as you know, it was track and field and baseball. Mm -hmm. All right, we're going to come back because because I'm going to, I may have you sing some, I don't know oh yet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, think of a song. I'm going to try. I don't really know all the words. All right, and last but not least. Edward Robert. Hold, hold the mic up. Edward Robert Gilmore. I was born in Columbus, Ohio, 1926. My father left when I was three or four. My mother tried to work when we lived in a duplex. So she left us alone. My brother is uh, 15 months older than me. My sister's, uh, no. My brother was the oldest. My sister is the oldest. And the next thing my brother, I mean, I was. So uh, the people from the children's home came and got us and put us in the home because we were left by ourselves. So we went to court and uh, Busted the whole family. Mm. Wow, that must have been uh, that must have been something. Yeah, it was. Mm. I guess that's really why I, I don't communicate too much. Yeah. Raised by myself, and uh, 
God has been good to me. I got after I. Oh boy. I went. I, I, um, Take your time, tell it. Okay. The uh, children's home would give people a chance to raise the child so they could have a home experience. So the lady that raised me, uh, they stopped paying a little bit after I was 16. I think they stopped paying me for it, but she, she kept me. But then I went to um, high school, and uh, it's a black high school with a white teacher. And the, uh, my English teacher told me that I was stupid to get up and give my chair to somebody that could so I had to go back to the home and I told him I was going to run away if I had to go back. She said, you're close enough to get into service, so why don't you, why don't you uh, join the service? And I did. But then um, I, I thought I was going to have a career in the service, but they didn't. They didn't want me to have a career in there. So after I got out, I um, I get a little fuzzy there. They give me muster not paying. Being stupid, I squandered it. And uh, then uh, I, I finally went back home to my, it was my mother. And I don't know, my life's been messed up. You know what, Mr. Gilmore, I, you, you know, I'm listening to you speak, um, and the things that, the way that you speak is eloquent. Um, but, and I hear the words that you're using, and I think that those are terms that someone has put on you, and not who you are. I, and I just wanted, I felt compelled in my spirit to share that with you, because you're here, and you have a story that needs to be told. Because listen, there are people who are in foster care right now who can't even envision themselves at 90 years old, who, who don't think that they can make it that long, you know, and, and still have worth. You know, you have, you have kids, you know, that, that love you. Um, your daughter gave me a packet on you and I saw your pictures from your naval career. Those things are important. And the story that you have to tell is gonna help someone is going to save someone's life. Because they're going to look at you and go, you're still, Mr. Gilmore is still standing. And they, and what was said about him is the same thing that they're saying about me right now. I don't have to believe that because I see an example standing in front of me that outlasted those people who had negative things to say. Well, I joined the church at nine and God has been good to me so I got to get over the habit of not being worthy. So let's just change gears. I want to I ask you guys a couple of questions. Um, I think three of you, and I don't know about, about you, Mr. Ms. Robinson, but I mean, sorry, uh, Mr. Gilmore, um, talked about being a kid and living on a plantation. Wow, I, you know, I have kids who, you know, if the, if the cable goes out, if the internet goes out, they, they mad, they, got, they don't know what they're going to they die, you know, and so I can't even imagine what it would be like to, uh, to have grown up or been a kid living on a plantation, so can, can, can you guys just kind of tell me about that, take, take, take turns and talk about life living on a plantation. But please do me a favor, speak into the mic because we got to capture this recording. I'll, I'll say that living on the plantation was really, it was, it was beautiful because the owners, the original, the ones that, um, you know, that purchased from Ireland, Irish, Irish, uh, we had everything. We didn't have, did not have to 
struggle and like say, uh, today you have county uh, people on the county. I really didn't know what county and, and welfare or anything. I didn't know what all of that meant until I got married in 1955. But as a kid growing up, we had our own garden and my mom used to can goods. And uh, after she had had, what, 15 children, she went back to school and became a beautician. She had a uh, beauty and culture uh, uh, instruction down in Tallahassee, Florida. We would just, we lived right, right at the top of Florida, Georgia line. If you look at the map of the lower part of the United States. Okay, so Pebble Hill Plantation, they, they, on the plantation, they worked and my dad, I could remember years ago when he got paid on Fridays, his paycheck was all in cash. They would give him cash. They never got checks. They got cash and he would come bring it home and my mom and dad would go shopping on Saturday. And uh, we had a beautiful family life. Church was off, the church was built on the plantation for the uh, workers that uh, were, um, worked for the, um, say, the white people in those days. Because there were three brothers, I believe, as my dad would tell us, that came from Ireland. And they found out that North America was more prosperous for cultivation of fruits, vegetables, and um, growing of cotton and cane and all that kind of stuff more so than the northern part of the United States. So was that, was that a sharecropping thing? Sharecropping was mostly done like between, I would say, from like Maryland, right on down through uh, Kentucky, Virginia, uh, uh, South Carolina, Georgia, on to Florida with the citrus, you know, the fruit, and I don't know, into California. And what they did, my, my heritage, my family, where I came from, they went to Africa to people, to the people to do the work on the plantation. They went and made beards of Africans in Africa and left money with African people over there for their, I want this one, I want that one, I want the other. And, and, and this they was brought in them to America. What year? And this was way back in my, well, Mrs. Robinson and her family came to California. My husband, um, my mother, with her five children, she divorced her husband and left him in Georgia in 1920. But we traced our family roots back to 1700 on my dad's side, 1760 on my mom's side from England. And they also did the same thing, the white people they caught in those days. And uh, brought the, the Africans to America. And my great, great, I'm the fourth generation of the white slave owner. And he fathered children by some of the Africans. So this is where we come in the picture. <laughs> and so, life, so. life for us was just like, you can, can compare San Marino to Pasadena. We never had to worry about anything. The homes were built, and we had our church, we had our school house. So, so let me ask you this. Yes, sir. So during the time that you were um, were living on the plantation, mm -hmm. you experienced the person who owned the plantation fathering children from the people who lived there? My, my, my dad explained to us about that uh, procedure that would happen, that is what happened, that uh, that was our heritage. And our family now is so large, we have been able to, we have a, a family reunion, uh, and I have a brother that was my last brother that was in the service in, in the Vietnam War. He um, started a, um, family reunion because there's so many of us, so many women of the Hadley, it's called H-A-D-L-E-Y, Hadley's from Ireland. And uh, so we have a very large family reunion and have one every year. We have over a thousand relatives we've located across the United States. Let me, uh, let me bump to uh, Mr. Lai. Let me tell me about your experience as a child uh, on the plantation. My experience was 
absolutely the opposite of her experience. Mm. We were serious. And our objective was, the objective of my mother and father was to have a roof over our heads and food on the table. And we worked from 7 o'clock in the morning until 6 o'clock in the evening. And when the bell tolled, we got up at 4.30 in order to be in the field at 7. Were you uh, picking cotton or fruit or what were you doing in the field? We were, we were sh sharecroppers and the two major things that we farmed was cotton and corn. We raised our own hogs, chickens, and cows. We always had enough food to eat. Maybe not as much as we wanted to eat, but enough to eat. The situation, if I understood you, that your situation was a pleasant situation. My growing up on the plantation was not a pleasant situation. Uh, it seems as if your community was a peaceful community without violence. No, and no my community was very, very violent. And we were a, a very religious family. Now, now, when you say violent, what do you mean violent how? I mean, uh, on Saturday night, from Friday night to through Saturday night, in my community, some young man or young woman was shot, cut, sometimes killed, or left for dead, and it was just not safe. And was this violence? Within the community, I mean, it was black on black violence. Black on black crime, which the plantation all tolerated. Black on white crime, you went to jail. And so uh, I remember in 1932 when Roosevelt was elected president and took office in 1933. We didn't have social security, except the children were the social network for the parents. And so there were seven boys in my family. And so when you say social network, you mean that was a social, that was a support. In other words, yes. your kids took care of you as you aged. If you didn't have kids, you... If you didn't have them. kids, you... It was very difficult. As, as my parents would say, that was a hard road to home. Oh, that's, yes, very hard. And the... From, I, from what I got from you, the plantation owner was rather civilized. He was really um, very com communicated with the employees that worked for him. Because, uh, see, and, and, and many of the, the things that you mentioned there concerning Roosevelt, you see, he's responsible for Social Security. Yes. And that made it possible for so Social Security today is is what I myself have received. 
And so, uh, and, 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 and what really motivated me, I'm, I'm in the medical field. So I'm retired. Um, I'm kind of in a feeling with your discussion there about uh, plantation life. But to move on down really quickly here. I'm, I'm retired from working in five hospitals all the way from Georgia to New York, right into Pasadena, St. Luke's, Huntington, and ended up at LA County USC Medical Center in emergency nursing. So what motivated me in the medical field was at the age of nine, I became very ill. And my mom at first said, oh no, you just need to just take care of yourself, run and go to the, at that time it was a toilet outside. And it was not that, and it got worse. So um, they called in the nurse on the plantation. We had a plantation nurse, the doctor would come in from the city to make sure we all got our shots. And um, we were well taken care of, all of the plantation workers. You know what's very interesting is that you guys have like almost diametrically opposed experiences. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a life on a plantation. Now, you were in what area again? I was in southwest Arkansas. Southwest Arkansas, and you were at the Georgia, Georgia Florida line. Right, south, and see, you could say east. Uh, well, let's see, Tallahassee, Florida. If you look at the lower part of the United States map, there is um, Valdosta, Georgia, Waycross, there's Atlanta. So we are south of Atlanta, Georgia. Okay. Thomasville, Georgia is just the border of Georgia, Florida, Tallahassee, Florida. Hmm. That's just that's interesting because it's it's the same type of organization, a plantation, yet yet very, very different. Hold your thought for just did you hear something? Because I want I wanted to I wanna to get to I wanna hear her. I wanna Go ahead. Okay, and then we'll, we'll come back. We've been, we've been, we're going to talk for a while. So, Miss Houston Foster, let me hear. Tell me, tell me what it was like growing up or, or having being a child on a plantation. Me? Yes, ma'am. Say it again. What was it like growing up being a child on a plantation? Well, it was very nice. We thought it was nice. There were four besides me, and our daddy plowed in the field with horses and a plow. And it was once in a while we could see my mother's father, he was a minister. And on Sundays, he would be sure to see and we went to Sunday school, and it was five or six of them, him, his wife, and, and the children. So it, it was very nice. Now, you know, it was, what, what I'm wondering too is, is does that have anything to do with, because I'm listening to you describe your father working out in the field and doing all those sort of things, and it was nice for you guys, right? Is that a male-female thing, possibly? Because you, your, your experience is that you was out in the field from, six, from 7 in the morning till 6 and getting up at 4 to get started. I'm just wondering, does that have anything to do with, you know, men had to go out and do heavy, hard labor, and you guys had to, uh, 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 kind of a lighter load to carry, or, I don't know, are you going to speak to that? We had heavy lifting, hard work. And it wasn't easy. The plantation owner and the people who worked for the plantation owner were not nice to the black folk who lived on the plantation. I recall in the spring and summer, when you are cultivating the cotton and the corn, you are chopping cotton and you are hoeing cotton. You chop the cotton 
when it's young and weeds and grass is plentiful. What, what were you chopping with? A hole. And you would chop the cotton. And then uh, as the uh, summer came, you would hold it. Now when you chop the cotton, you thin the cotton and you cut all of the weeds from around it. When you hold, you didn't have to uh, thin the cotton out. You would just cut the weeds away and then it would grow to maturity. And <clears throat> we had two uh, uh, times when we went to school because during the uh, harvesting, the cultivation season and the harvesting season conflicted with the September to May. So we went to school in the summertime because we had to be out of school in the fall and early time, in the early fall and, and late fall because we were harvesting the cotton and the corn. So, so would it be safe for me to say that your education came second to the prosperity of the landowner, right? So you, you had to work around when they could make money. That's right. Let me ask you one other question. Um, so in, in my generation, and I have seen this, where uh, it kind of goes back and forth. But there's this, you know, there was a time period where, you know, light skin, black, dark skin, you know, that whole issue was, was really out there. And so I, 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 I pose that because of this. I'm listening to you, you two, and you, you, didn't, you didn't grow up on a plantation, so we're gonna come back to you because I got some stuff for you too. I ain't forget about you over there. <laughs> um, so I'm looking at you two lovely ladies. You two lovely light skin, Ladies, I'm looking at my brother over here, dark skin, strong, you know, handsome man, black man, and I'm hearing two totally different experiences. So I'm wondering, does that have something to do with it, maybe? Okay, I can tell you this much. I better, but get, get the microphone because yeah, I want to hear you. I can tell you this much about the color part of that. Um, when we were growing up, my father, they, uh, they, what they would do, they would separate. There were so many of us, couldn't, they look white and they look dark, like my friend here, dark complexion. And what they would do, the darkest of the Hadleys worked in the fields, mm. and the lighter uh, Hadleys all worked in the, they call it the big house. Right. I wish I had brought that picture. I did bring some pictures of part of my family that I'll talk about a little later, but uh, on my husband's side. But they, they work in, they call it the big house, the white house. And uh, they did a lot of work, made work, cooking, serving the people, and uh, what small gardens that was done in a close near in the, on the plantations. And the darker ones are the ones that did the plowing. So what you just said was that they, they separated according to hue. Yes. Darker folk had to go out and do heavy lifting out in the field. And then the lighter folks worked in the big house. They got exactly. to, to do the stuff in the big house. Exactly. I mean, that's, that's, that's consistent with what I heard. Um, but, and, and I see you, I, mean, I want to get to what you, I want to hear what you have to say. Um, and, and we'll talk about what I want to afterwards, but I just want to put it out there on the table. I want to know what that had, what kind of effect that had within our community. So the dark skinned folks come in tired from working out in the field all day. Um, the light skinned folks have been in the big house, in the white house. You know, what kind of inner community, you know, strife that caused is something I, I wanted to see if we can address. But, uh, Mr. Lai, you're going to say something. I wanted to say that these two sisters are the results of a time before we lived on the plantation. Slavery, when 
there was a different kind of relationship between slaves and the slave owner. Sometimes the slave owner would mistreat and abuse the young women. And consequently, we have all of these colors. Black folk in America celebrates every color and hue you can name. And so I congratulate you. You are beautiful. And you represent a time when there was equality. There is no unequality in the bed. That is so true because in my family, there are, we're mixed. Yes. Because the slave, um, the white slave owner, I'm the uh, fourth generation of, he is my great great grandfather. Was white. It was white. Yes. He's from Ireland. And his son fathered children by the African women that they brought over. And this is where the color yes. of the light and the really fair and the hair mm -hmm. was different. And so this is why. They work the way they put them to work. And you know, the Africans build a White House in Washington, D.C. That's right. And so we must never forget that. We have to give. And so for one good thing I would like to really quickly say is that my brother that did a museum, we have the first black museum on the plantation in Georgia. Mm. That is, he's collected over 3,000 pieces of artifacts. And it's in Thomasville, Georgia, on the plantation there, near the high school where we went to high school. And um, he, he has collected so much material that it's, it's, in, it's on the internet, if you would look up Jack Hadley, um, I believe it's Jack Hadley um, Museum in Thomasville, Georgia. That's the Jack Hadley Museum in Thomasville, Thomasville Georgia. Georgia. And it's really, it's out there. Miss Foster, yes. when she was talking, I saw you light up a couple of times. It was something you wanted to say when she was talking about, you know, uh, having white, white ancestry and the light skin, dark skin controversy within the black community. Well, I was kind of laughing. And it was exactly the same all over everywhere. I want, you, I want you to keep that mic in front of you so we can get this on recording. Oh. Yes, ma'am, thank you. We had uh, a man to nurse us, somebody my father knew. And this man took us wherever we had to go, whatever we had to do, this man would do it with us. So we were a little bit different, not exactly the same. And uh, we had a a, a, a mill where we had horses that would draw, drag a plant around and make cane syrup. You know what the syrup yes. is? Yes, ma'am. Hills would go around, and we had big bells that was almost full of cane syrup, mm -hmm. which is very good. So it was a little different, you know. To yeah, I, that I, I remember those I days remember with it. the horse yes. going around. Yeah, and my father, my father drove a, a school bus. Horses would pull it, and then they put a motor in it. It would take the white kids to school, and the black kids had to walk to school yes, down the yes. muddy road. So yes. it's just so much I could tell you yes. that I can't say right now what happened. Yes. But it was It was different for different yeah. for whites and blacks. Yeah. Let me let me let me just let me just pop over to Mr. Robinson for a second. What's what's your experience your your black white experience as you were because you talked about some things when you were in the Navy. Um, and how they sold you a bill of goods going in the door. But once you got in the door, because of your color, 
it was a totally different story. Can you can you talk to us about that? I was going to try to uh, make a career. Maybe if, uh, they didn't let me because I was um, the wrong color. I couldn't get what I wanted to do because I wanted to be a mechanic. But God blessed me enough that I finally wound up being a mechanic because I uh, trusted the Lord all the time. Other than that, I would, you can look around and see how blessed you are from, from your, uh, your uh, situation. But um, I, I raised my family. I got uh, five grandchildren, one granddaughter, and two great grandkids. So, and my family has really been doing good. They, uh, everybody's is accomplished something, and I'm thankful to the Lord for that. So, um, you volunteered for the Navy. Yeah. Um, and you signed up to be a mechanic. Yeah. Tell me, tell me just a little bit more about how you felt. I mean, how that whole process went when you got there, and and they told you that you could you could either be uh, what was it, a service mate, or I can't think of the name, or 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 a cook, steward's mate, or a cook, right? Yeah. Those were your two options, yeah. regardless of what you signed up for. Yeah. Right. How did that? I mean, how did that happen? Well, I I, I was very very disappointed, but uh, I found out being a cook is the best place I could have been, because food can get you anything you want. Uh, you was working a little food angle on the people in the boat, huh? Right. Like, uh, okay, you want a little extra something? You're going to have to, okay. Yeah. And the doctor always stuck behind you because he was in charge of how well the food was served and what food you could serve. Because I know I was really blessed. One day we had beans and I had them soaked beans. Got about it. But then the Lord right. said, the Lord said, put it in the pot, boil it, drain it, boil it, drain it, boil it. When it comes out clean, you got beans. And uh, I used to be able to smell the food and see what uh, was lacking in the food. That's the skill set. Yeah. I can't do that until I taste it. And then uh, I'm kind of, I kind of, I'm, I'm better with salt. I don't use salt. What, what he said about the Navy. When you finish, go yeah. ahead. No, I'm finished. I don't and talk much anymore. They told my brother that he could be an engineer when he was when he was uh, recruited. When he got there, they said, you can be a cook or you can be a steward. And that's what he was. He became a chef and then uh, later on, he became a steward and he served the captain. And one thing we always will remember is that he had an allotment made to my mother, money. And he said that on the captain's desk were all of the allotment applications. Mm -hmm. And he served the captain from on the, at his desk. And he went in one day and he had, my mother's application was there. So he didn't wait for the captain to approve it. He took the captain's stamp and approved it and moved it from one side of the desk to the other. And she got her a lot then. <laughs> I tell you, these stories, these are, you know, we may have to do part two of this. But, I, I, but right now I want to move to some of the questions. So um, we gathered some questions from folks online. And there were some things that they just wanted to know from, from folks like you who know. So I'm going to ask you some questions, and 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 we'll go from there. Let's start. Let's start with um, let's start with you, Miss Foster. 
Here's a question. Knowing what you know now, knowing what you know now, if you were half your age, would you take more risk? And what would you do differently? Well, say, say it again. So knowing what you know now, if you were 51, is there anything that you'd do differently? I think it would be. I would do things differently. What would they be? Well, what would that be? I would have gone to school when I was young, according to age group. I would have been in school. I would not, well, I was good to my sisters and brothers, those that was younger than I was, I was very good to them. We had to wash and iron sometimes at night in order to go to school clean the next day. I just, right now, I can't say, but in a number of things, I would have done it in a different way. So what you said, though, was, was you talked about education, the importance of education. Yes. And, and the love for your family. Yes. That would be a good way for me to summarize it? Yes. Okay. I want to I take a male perspective on that question. Um, so I'm going to ask you the same question. If you were, are you 88, right? You're 88, right? So if you were 44, half your age, um, what, what would you do if knowing what you know now, would you do anything differently? And if you would, what would you do differently? Well, let's go back, further back than 44. I think that if I had to do it over again, I would be a more disciplined student in college and I would have been better prepared to do what I wanted to do. And uh, so at 44, I would have achieved more than I have achieved because I didn't do the things I would do now if I uh, have the opportunity. Yes, the, again, back to the value of discipline, discipline. A, a application of yourself, and education. An application, yes. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Yes. Um, when, you, when you don't go to the army in World War II and you go to college with the veterans that are in college, you have two communities. The veterans came to college and they were serious. They had families and they studied. Those of us who were just slightly too young for World War II went to high school, went to college, and what did we do? We played, you know, we were young. We, we, we didn't have responsibility at that time. So it's really about applying yourself at a young age yes. so that you don't have to do the heavy lifting on the back end now. I, I, amen. Exactly. Amen. So I want to ask this, I want to move on to this next question and I'm going to ask you, Miss Robinson. Yes, of course. So I'm going to tell you, I'm going to say this statement mm -hmm. and then I want you to tell me, have you found this statement to be true? Okay. This is, this is what people want to know. The statement is, it's a part of a sentence, and you'll get where it comes from. It's, it's one nation under God with liberty and justice for all. Being a black woman in America who, who lived on a plantation and gone through the things that you've seen, have you found that statement to be true? On a plantation, I would say that you, uh, to me, I'm, I'm, I'm proud of the experience that I had personally of what it was like 
Yeah. What, what I'm asking, let me just let me clarify. This is about not specifically the plantation experience, it's the experience, it's the American experience as a black woman. As, as a black woman, I, I think that we had, had, an, had had an opportunity to um, really um, be more uh, outgoing. The things for us would, would be better if it had not been for the sign that says white over here and it says black or colored over there. But you see, after that was changed, it, and now it makes it much better that the um, opportunities are much open, wider, where we can make a choice and be more proud of ourselves. Today, as uh, years back when I was growing up, we got along fine with the white people and there were really aren't any problems on, on the plantation, but it really make a lot of difference today with the opportunities. But the thing is, young people today should really try to take advantage of all these opportunities that are here for them because scholarships weren't even uh, in my day. Today, they're all over. Because, as you know, my brother-in-law, Jackie, that broke the color barrier in 1947, I think his picture's up here somewhere on some of these boards here. Mm -hmm. But anyway, um, breaking the color barrier, it made it possible for not only women, but men and black men and also the Spanish people to you know, I know we're, I know that we're in the question and answer, but but I gotta get I gotta get you to talk about this. In the green room, we were speaking about the experience of the 1932 Olympics. Um, you know, with, with your husband winning a medal, your your brother-in-law uh, winning a medal, and then uh, it being in Germany and, and Hitler's response to to that whole. I mean, I'm, I'm sitting here in front of someone who lived that experience as as you know was their relatives and husband and brother-in-law. Can you, can you share with us, um, can you share with the audience that experience of, of that time period and, and what your family actually did in breaking, you know, winning the gold and, and you know, the medals there and the response from the Third Reich? Well, what I could try to say from what Mac has relayed to me is that um, uh, Pasadena for sure really did not recognize him when he came from Germany. And this is after, after yeah, meddling exactly. in the Olympics. He was, this is the 36 Olympics, not the 32. That was at the Coliseum, 36. And um, in, Germany. in Germany. In Germany, my bad. Yes, in Germany. So coming back to home here, only three people met him at the train station. But you see, with now today, um, there's joy, there's uh, um, uh, exploitation of enjoyment, and, and peace is much easier today than it was long in the time of, of uh, uh, years back. And it was, it was very hard, but with the bag that, of uh, items that they would give to the Olympians to take in 36 were well, like so. A very small, like a shoebox size, just a sweater. And of course, the shoes that he won the silver medal in, he couldn't even get any new shoes to, um, to wear in Germany. They would not give him any shoes. Those shoes that I have today, I should have brought the picture. I'm so sorry I didn't. But the shoes are the same ones he wore at. Washington Junior High School here in Pasadena, Pasadena City College, and John Muir High School, and to the University of Oregon, and on into Germany. So times were times were really pretty rough, and uh, and for Jackie, he had it tough himself. And with Jackie, uh, Mr. Ricky knew what a temper he had being a great athlete, and he asked him, he says, I want you um, to, you're going to be humiliated many a day. I want you to, actually, to keep your tongue in your mouth and turn the cheek the other way. And, with the, and that made the doors 
open wider. And so today, the gentleman that everyone, boys and girls that are participating in getting these large contracts are able to get them now. So you, you told me in the green room that um, when the race was being run and then it was finally won mm -hmm. and the medals were uh, going to be handed out, mm -hmm. uh, that Hitler was infuriated and refused to come down in, to yes. the field for the ceremony that was planned. Yes, Mr. Hitler, when uh, the 200-meter race it was, Jesse had already won three gold medals. And uh, this would have been, this was, was really the fourth gold medal. And when uh, they were announcing the winners at the end of the race, uh, they called his name and it, uh, it burned him to no end to know, oh, an American? Because he really did not want the Americans to be a part of the 1936 games. He hated it so bad because he knew and he had heard how great the athletes were that are coming to Germany, to his Nazi uh, 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 country at that time. So what happened um, uh, uh, when uh, Jess's name was called, he was getting red in the face. Then when they called again in the United States, number two, and they called my husband's name, Matt, it was really infuriating to him because he was so angry, he got up and walked out of the stadium. And the bronze medal went to a German guy. But no, Hitler was very humiliated. Wow, he didn't, he didn't he like didn't, the idea of, a, of American like the or a black American. Exactly, he just didn't. He wasn't wow. happy. What is the most important advice you would give to a child of this generation? Follow God always works. Right. Because we get to the point now we're after money and prestige and we, we don't realize that God has a plan for all of us and if we pay attention to it we can find a plan and make life a lot better. I like that. Same question for you, yes. What is the most important advice that you would give to a child of this generation? Well, this generation, I would really like to say I'm retired, as I said earlier, from L.A. County And I was so contented sitting at home, and then after uh, my husband passed in 2000, I went back to school. At my age, early, I don't know, maybe age 60, I guess, or so. And um, I took up um, uh, daycare for, to open up daycare for working mothers to take care of their children while they work. So I was licensed by the state of California for a daycare uh, in my home. And I had that for about almost 10 years until I came down with breast cancer. And then on top of that, I was, still wasn't satisfied. So I went to Altadena and I took classes for foster children and I worked with five acres about four years prior to my surgery. And uh, so since that time in 2006, I've been in just total retirement at home. But um, I would say that uh, youngsters should really take advantage of the different offers that are out there today because when we were growing up, we paid attention to mom and dad, we did our homework, and uh, we attended church, and we had good uh, services at church and Sunday school, and participated in, in activities in the com community, which really uh, instilled in, in us that for your future, try to obey and things will open up for you. But first, love yourself. I love that, I love that. Did you guys hear what she said? Education, community, and self-love. Yeah, those three things are important. You gotta love yourself, you gotta get education. As my dad would say, you gotta get some fat on your head. <laughs> and you gotta love yourself. Two, and just as beautiful as you can be. I'm going to ask you that same question. 
What's the most important advice that you would give to a child of this generation? I would tell them to go to school. Amen. Education. Learn all that they can learn. It is so very important. Among so many other things right now, I can't say exactly what I would tell them. I asked, what you just said was great. It's education. Yes. You know, here, here's the thing that's amazing to me is uh, you don't get to be 102 and not have a whole lot of wisdom. Whether you can't say it at the moment or not, it just comes out of who you are. And if you say education at 102, that's meaningful. And that's so far, that's three out of four. And he talked about it earlier. He was kind of shaking his head, but I won't give him a chance to yes. answer that question for himself. A, a shameless plug, <laughs> shameless plug for Mr. Lyle. Um, he actually wrote off of this book, it's called Hard Trials, Great Tribulations. Um, he published this book himself, and it talks about many of the issues that we've been covering and talking about in this, in this interview. Um, I think you can go online and get it at his website, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, is it on Amazon? Or go to Amazon. Uh, the author is James V. Lyles. The book is Hard Trials, Great Tribulations. Good read. I suggest that you pick up one. And I'm getting him to sign mine today, so. Uh, the, the, oh, it's already signed. I haven't even opened it up yet. All right. This is mine. You can't have it. So, Mr. Lyle, I'm ask you this question, and then, uh, and then we're probably going to be done shortly after that. What is the most important piece of advice that you would give to a child of this generation? Education, 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 education. I want, once you settle that, you go into secondaries. And then the second thing, well, let me say this. When I was an adolescent, my mother and father didn't know anything. It was my peer group. And I would say to adolescents, you, make your parents a part of your peer group because your peers that's good that's good your peers will go in all directions and you will be with them but when something happens to you your parents your sister your brother will be there i want you i want you to do me a favor i want you to do me a favor look over there in camera look directly in camera number two and say that to the people I would say after education is for adolescent and older youth to make their parents a part of their peer group because peer groups go in all directions but if something bad happens to you the peer group is going to scatter and it would be your mother, your father, your sister, or your brother who will come and have to take care of you. Now that means slow down, listen, glue your lips together, and bore a hole in your ears so you will hear what is being said and follow the good things that are being said and you will be a part of the generation of people, black people, all people who will go up, up, up. I don't think we could have closed any better than that. Well, I, I, I would like to say something quickly here. So, in the middle again, in the middle again, this is Jesse. Jesse? Jackie, I'm sorry. Yes, this is Jesse Owens right here. This one, that's Mac, and that's Ewan Williams. And this gentleman was a classmate of Max. He was on the Olympic team in uh, 1936. And these are some businessmen from Los Angeles. I'm not sure what, who their names are. This is in 1936. And this is when we celebrated just last year Mac was 100 years old, and the city of Pasadena uh, gave an honoring right in front of the 
big heads that are the um, uh, statues of the heads of Mac and Jackie in front of City Hall right in Pasadena. The head is looking straight at City Hall, that's Mac. The one that's looking east, that's Jackie. Now this is a proclamation that was presented to Mac when he participated in the 1984 Olympics in Los Angeles. He was on the team that helped walk the Olympic flag in the Coliseum in 1984. And over on the side over here, the next picture here, I would just kind of point to, he had a service station over in Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. And uh, he just kept busy. He just couldn't sit still with himself. And so, it was just, just before he had the heart attack, the one way up in the far uh, left over here. In the middle is the when he was a student and uh, attendance in track and field at uh, Pasadena Junior College, but now he's Pasadena City College. And this is him here holding his 1936 medal. All right. And tell the youth that uh, yes. Mrs. Robinson, we give credit to her. She was both mommy and daddy to her five children from 19 and 20 till her. It is, it is up on the shoulders of those that came before us in which the generation current uh, stands. And so with that, I want to say that you guys represent those pillars. The four of you are the foundations for the things that our youth will do, uh, you know, in the future. Um, and so it's with that, I, I, I want to just say that uh, the following is, please remember that always revered in any society has been the people who were the keepers of the stories. Those were the folks who people gathered around to hear the history of their people, to help inform them as to who they should be going forward and growing up, and then to pass those stories on to their generation to come beyond them. We have before us four people who are those who represent the stories, the gatekeepers, the storytellers, the people in society who are revered and are gonna help prepare, propel our future generations to greatness. It is the shoulders upon the Mac Robinsons and these fine people we have here that our children will stand on and will currently stand on. Let's continue to treat them and revere them with the respect that they deserve. Um, thank you for tuning in for then and now. I'm Curtis Thompson. We'll see you next time. about the show today it's great it's a great show all right and tell them how old you are again yeah. how old are you again 102 Woo. and when's your birthday the 8th of June you have a birthday coming up I mean, soon yes they're gonna make a fuss of it <laughs> Now, what's, what's yeah. the secret? What's the secret? Do you eat no, differently? Just, what is it? Just do what you do every day. And I said above all things, be good to children and to senior citizens. Don't forget those two. If you do it, you'll make it. All right. <laughs> what would you think about it? Oh, that's real nice. It's, it's good to have all the information you can get. Cause, like they say, if you don't know where you've been, you don't know where you're going. Exactly. 
Yeah, what did you think about the show today? Well, I think it was really a very exciting and um, educational. We tried to tell our story as we were youngsters ourselves and see, make the comparison with what's going on today. The opportunities are bigger and they're better and the doors are wide open and we advise youngsters to please take advantage. All right. Do that.